The master runner will typically demonstrate a higher cadence that is inversely proportioned to step length. You'll also see a more flexed knee and foot position on striking and reduced uh, ankle, knee, and hip excursion during the loading phase. There's less vertical oscillation of the center of mass during running as well. And you'll also see a reduced or peak impulse on foot off. The first runner discussed is the six-year-old male, and we discuss the foot strike pattern and swing patterns of this individual. What we'll notice is that there is very little flight phase in the master's runner. The next case is a 55-year-old master athlete with a, as you'll see, the similar characteristics that were discussed in the first slide of the master's athlete. Certainly a flexed posture with running, a stiffness in the lower extremity, as well as what we notice, stiffness in the thoracic spine, which will transfer forces and load down into the uh, lower spine. With the rear view, what we'll see is the increased hip adduction angle and pelvic drop on the left. What well, can't be noted is the hip internal rotation. A great video. You see how it runs. Yeah, I'll pull the other one. Well, I was going to say, I don't even see a runner. <laughs> Hold on. Let me come back. I had some button, something funky happened. Hold on. There I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm there. I'm going to mute, mute myself so you guys don't have to listen to me too. So sorry about that. Look for the other video. This was, I was getting example videos of a, let's see, now my screen's not sharing, let me share screen. Any sample videos, one of the things I was doing was putting a couple of master's runner slides together. So to pull this up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and clean these videos up, but you know, what you'll see in the master's runner is kind of a classic, they all have the same kind of classic running style where you get a lot of stiffness in the joints. It'll slow down in a second. You kind of generally what you'll see is ankle stiffness, knee and hip. You would get a lot less excursion in them. You'll see it. So you see a lot less recovery. This guy actually did run training with me for a while. So his recovery is not good because he's practicing a higher recovery. When I initially saw him, he was getting a lot of lateral knee pain in his right knee. And he was basically landing with his knee almost fully, maybe at 10 degrees of extension. So he was hitting the ground really hard down in front of him. So one of the things we worked on with him for a while was to again, bring, his, bring his heel strike back underneath of him a bit more. Also be able to absorb forces and recover faster. And what that allows him to do is just dissipate forces and not hit the ground quite as hard. So he's still stiff and, and kind of age appropriate. He's about 64. But he actually absorbs better than what you see most people. And what commonly what you see here too is that toe off and heel strike generally occur pretty close together. Like these older say, runners, it's a short flight phase. It's more like a, it's more like a jog. And that's what you'll see in any of the masters runners is that that flight phase almost doesn't exist. So on the EMG curves, it kind of becomes this blend between walking and running. When you look at muscle on times, like certain muscles, like gastroc soleus will be on a bit longer and more delayed, you know, soleus on time and gastroc on time is a little bit longer or, or delays into it. Cause in running gastroc soleus is more in, Early, early to mid stance and then tailors off in late stance. Where in walking, you have gastroc soleus is more active in later stance in the, the later propulsion and push off phase. So in a runner like this, they tend to kind of drag out that gastroc soleus phase. Let me play this on. So there's the slow it down. That's kind of a mid stance phase where you can kind of see just the amount of flexion he has. And it's not significant from where he started but a much better knee recovery angle. When he first came with me, his basically his knee was never getting to 90 on his swing leg. Mm. He was just trying to, what he ended up, what he ended up doing is just dorsiflexing his foot and kind of coming through, but he also stayed a little bit more rigid because having this leg not open up as much, you don't flex as much to the hip and knee and ankle. You're trying to run tall, so you don't have to do a, a large swing of the leg. So it also dictates how much force you may be willing to absorb through the body. That's his strike point right there. So with this, his heel is a little bit, as he as his first loading phase is, it's pretty close where you want it just right out in front of his center of mass. I mean, ideally, center of mass would be a little bit further forward. 
But that's, yeah, it that's, seems like he's almost leaning backwards. That's pretty typical. He's still pretty far back, but it's kind of a, it's tough to tell in a, in a still shot because you kind of can see yeah, it looks far back, but it's also about how fast his center of mass accelerates over his, his foot, his base of support. So when you look at like elite runners, like marathon runners, like they're striking way out in front of them. By the time they load their leg, their center of mass is over top of their foot. Even though the heel cushion in their shoe may contact out in front of them, the acceleration in their body mass is moving so fast that in the loading phase, they're actually loading right over top of their foot. A little faster one here. It's hard to, maybe a little harder to pick up. You see him here. doesn't look quite as bad, but I would still like his center of mass his hips a little bit more forward. And you can even see it here, how he's a little bit more bent at the pelvis. The toe off. Again, going back into mid stance where he's there, you know, swing leg is higher than normal. But just knowing that stiff profile of that runner, you know, the same thing, you'll see the stiff profile, you know who else looks like this? Your typical triathlete coming off a bike. Your triathlete who trains a lot. They run in this older, stiff style. They'll talk like a, the triathlete shuffle, they'll call it. But if you really kind of look at it, what they're running like, somebody's very stiff and somebody who's basically here. Not your elite guys. Your elite guys can kind of do it all. But, but, your, but your average uh, age grouper, they tend to appear that way. I'm going to go and pull up a uh, – see if I have another one. Masters female. Just master's female about Kara's age. Yeah, exactly. So 30, 32 year old female. I woke up like that. I woke up feeling like master's this morning. Mm -hmm. Just you wait. It's, and this style usually comes from ovary dehydration around the age of 32. <laughs> Sorry, same view here. It'll, it'll slow down a second. How old is she actually? She is 55. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. Yeah. She, she'll win her age group in, in local Ironmans and other things too. So even if you watch her run. Let's see. I got to slow down here. Let me see this here. Yeah. So I've been, I was playing with these videos last night. So some of them haven't got them all quite organized. But you can just see how stiff she is in different phases, you know, push off the heel strike again, very close. You know, look at the knee angle, not very well opened up here. I've seen her in the past. What she tends to get is she'll get her, her left, her left hip is probably getting degenerative. And what it'll get is she'll get, she'll get stuck again anteriorly in her left hip and it'll beat up her back. So she'll come in and she may have some, some glute or, or groin pain, but most commonly what she gets is, is left-sided lumbar pain from that hip jamming up and try to drive through it. Her spine is also pretty rigid as well. If, you, if you, the video is a little fast to pick it up, I'll have to cut one that, sl that, that slows it down. But her thoracic spine kind of moves as a unit when she runs. It's so common any... among distance runners though anyway, even, even, you know, not at this age, even in, you know, kind of their 20s, 30s. Yeah, you just see that kind of stiffness that she has where it's a lot of arm rotation. In some of these views in the arm, you can see that it's like, you know, the arm is rotated, but you see the whole thoracic spine as a unit just turns. You see, even in loading phase here, you know, this is second in, her knee recovery angle is quite, not quite as high as it could be. And just the open angle happens quick. You know, an elite runner is what they look for. I'll, I'll see if I can find another video of her. get like that last picture right there that last still frame right there almost looks like she could just be walking yes that's how short her stride is yeah that's what happens is people age they they with the stride from 20 to 60 the stride shortens by like like 13 yeah, percent but not more than that but yeah so was i you know and you can see there how she's still stiff she's getting full extension on that left side but again that's what's probably what's happening is that hip is oftentimes she doesn't get full extension out of it so she'll take it from the back. Now, if I slowed it down more, which you can see sometimes, is she may get a bit of a flexion moment. So that hip gets stiff. She'll take her lumbar spine, extend through there, while she's also trying to get very rigid and rotating. Yeah. And the upper thoracic spine is being, I'll talk about it, as she gets stiff up there, it's 
Think of that as a stiff mass balanced on L5 and driving forces down. That those discs in the thoracic spine should act like a spring. And it should be a shock absorber and attenuate forces. But if you put a fixed, a fixed basically block on top of the lumbar spine, now you have this fixed mass coming down on it like this, not compressing and giving and compressing and giving. So it kind of adds to some of the back problem probably in her that, you know, if she's not getting good enough rotation in the upper spine, spines just moving as a rigid lever, then it's gonna, it's gonna drive forces into her lumbar spine and down through. And it's yeah, definitely yeah. gonna make her use more muscular effort. Mm -hmm. Now she's not getting that spring right out of the thoracic spine, so she's That's gotta right. drive it from somewhere. Yeah. Look at her. So we get lower extremity energetics. Mm -hmm. So and it's a thing I can really get because they talk about it's that part of that trade off. Like their ground reaction forces go down. So she does this. Like she's landing midfoot, you know, by the time she loads. You know, aging runners tend to kind of choose a style which will decrease their ground reaction force because the joints don't want to absorb the force. I think that's what happens to us. I think we get a kind of sense of the irritability that happens in the aging runner. It becomes articular. And you get a sense that now oh, my joints don't particularly care for the loading. So you see this older runner adopt this a style which will decrease the vertical ground reaction force coming in. So the joints don't have to take as much load. The guy previously had a running style which actually accelerated the ground reaction force in his right leg where he had the knee pain. So landing kind of stiff on the right leg with a heel strike actually will drive more ground reaction force into the leg and into the knee, hip, and ankle, which was driving his pain. So moving him to strike more underneath of him, get a faster turnover. And I also worked a lot on just recovery, being able to recover with the knee at 90 through mid stance, and drive the hip forward a little bit further, and then bring the tibia down more vertical. So all those things should decrease the ground reaction for it, but made him move more efficient. So when I do speed training with anyone like this or retraining, Speed training becomes just those simple mechanical changes should make them faster. I don't try and say, okay, now run a 630. It's here are the mechanics that I want you to work on. I want you to work on hip drive, getting your foot off the ground a bit faster, coming, making sure your knee's coming through at 90 degrees and you drive your knee forward to maybe 30 degrees of hip flexion. And then you open the knee and place the foot. So the gait mechanics have to go faster, but again, having that knee flex through 90, also decreases the, the lever arm, like let's say hamstrings. I think hamstrings have to, and these guys have to decelerate the leg more when the knee opens faster. So for like her, for instance, in this frame, if that right knee is opening fast, the longer lever, having the foot further away from the hip. So the work on the hamstring is gonna be a little bit greater at some point because again, that the, the, just the weight and distance of deceleration of the leg. Yeah. So sometimes for these, for if it's a, if it's a proximal or a, mid, or a mid hamstring strain, it's one of the things you kind of play with is getting that knee up to 90 degrees through the recoil, not through active contraction, and then placing it down faster. You don't have that deceleration moment as isn't as great on the hamstring. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas if my leg is swinging and my knee is straighter, it's going to put more demand on my hamstring because the lever arm is longer. Sure. It's just more tension because it's going to elongate a little bit faster. You got sure, even compared to him, I mean, in, in a video frame that seems reasonable, like right there, like see how, see how her knee flexion isn't, you know, isn't all that great. If, if I can measure that angle, I don't know, but no, see, I'm going to stop her in another frame. Flight phase. There. Go, let me see if I can go back one. So if you compare that to someone who, for example, has a very weak left hip and mm -hmm. their right pelvis is dropped and so they have less vertical distance to pull their leg through and they're overactivating their, I mean, could they overactivate their hamstring to keep their knee flexed enough to pull it through in swing phase? What you should be doing Even is though, activating your hamstring in swing phase. In the early swing phase, your hamstring should be off. Your hamstring should be active, like, you know, basically kind of through mid stance a little bit. It gets a little peak. Mm -hmm. and, then it, and then it deactivates in late stance. But you're saying if you are, if you have less knee flexion mm -hmm. through the stance cycle, then the eccentric control of your, or the eccentric need on your hamstring is greater? 
No. Because you're, no. is that I'm what sorry, you're saying? I'm saying? Think of the swing leg. The eccentric demand on the hamstring would be less if my knee is flexed more. Because so when my foot comes off the ground, the natural recoil pops my hamstring up in the air. So when I swing my knee through at 90 degrees, it's 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 going to be it's going to be less stressful. Let me find the frontal. Hope another one here. Hold on. It'll be less stressful. Where if my knee is is is, low, is a lower swing angle like this coming through, then it's harder to do the long lever. But if my knee is at 90 degrees. My recoil to my knee at 90 degrees is that if I put fools on the ground, it pops up here. Mm -hmm. This is a shorter lever to then place my leg here. Whereas if I swing through here and do this, that's going to be a harder eccentric moment on the hamstring. This is, this is too fast to pick up, so I'm still processing this one. But on her left side, I'm actually going to strike more in the middle. So her hips, hips more adducted on there. She'll get an eversion moment in her ankle. And I'll pull up the image right there, pelvic drop. So you have eversion of the ankle coupled with pelvic drop in her as she gets on that left side with side bending of the trunk. Come back one more frame, see if I can get it back here. Loading. That one. right in there and collapse. So you can see how the angle of her leg, her right leg has to swing to almost clear the left leg. Because in mid stance, look how, look how her foot is in the middle of her base of support. Can you see the angle I'm talking about from her left mm -hmm. heel coming up right about her gluteal region, that yeah. side bending moment. Her pelvis will drop this way her center mass line moves too far over here. So she ended up kind of leaving a little side bend moment with her trunk, which it was, I think you couldn't see another video very well, but in this, in this particular image, you could see it. So it's a little dark here too. So there's also a ro rotational moment. As her foot in, she loads, let me see where her loading phase is. There, the foot, foot inverts. I believe the knee also immediately rotates. So the knee immediately rotating would also show, okay, is the femur following the foot? So she's going to invert or evert, foot collapses, tibia internally rotates. Femur can either torsion out like Matt does. I think Matt does this and you see his knee stays straight. So for his knee to stay straight while his foot's collapsing in, he's either got to control it from the foot and adjust for it all at the ankle or his tibia goes in and his femur's got to externally rotate on the knee and create a torsion. I think Matt's occur is completely at his foot. Good. So it's just nice that you see, you'll see his multiple kind of inversion style, but where she collapses differently than Matt, her whole lower extremity will follow it, the collapse of the hip. And again, you can see how it'll just drive forces up into her lower back. So typically what happens is, you know, with her, I'll do that, I'll mobilize her hip because she'll come in 15 degrees of hip external internal rotation. By the time she leaves, I can get her to use it to 30, 35 on the first visit. Okay. If the SI joint is, is, is off, I'll get the SI joint. Now, just I'll work my way through the lumbar spine. Sometimes L5 is jammed, sometimes it isn't. You know, then I needle her back, you know, just reset the tone, sacral multifidi, gluteal muscles. And, you know, that takes care of the kind of that the wind up that she'll get. And, of course, they think the needling is what fixes them. So she'll come back for the needling, and then I'll fix her real problem with the manipulation in the hip. I try and avoid needling at all costs. Mm -hmm. Not me. Whatever keeps them coming back. I have, I have no soul. I mean, what else do you do to reset the tone then? Or is, is I mean, how much, if you were seeing, if you were seeing 30 patients a day, mm -hmm. how do you have time to like do all that? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Do all what? You know, if you if you wanted to like reset the tone, like if you wanted to do everything that Dave just described without needling her, mm -hmm. what other techniques would you use, or or were you purely like manipulation? I mean, I well, can't manipulation really will reset you, like, the tone on its own. But will it? 
I mean, will that manage the like a pain generating trigger point as well over time? Actually, it'll, like it'll manage it better over time. The manipulation is what works better over time and resetting it. But what I'll use, where I'll use the needling is it's that it's down ramping in layers. So you can get the joint to move well, but the nervous system just hasn't completely adjusted yet. It, it, it'll wind down. Mm -hmm. So what happens with good manipulation is that, okay, if I just manipulate and leave them, it's like, oh, how did you feel later that night? It's like, oh, later that night, I just kind of really eased up and felt much better. That's the mechanical effect. You yeah. know, so if I know that, but if I needle them right away, it accelerates that mechanical, that, that release. They don't have to wait those few hours for the nervous system to unwind. The muscles go, oh, it's okay for me to move. It takes a little bit of time for that unwinding you'll see sometimes. So that's what I look for. If they come back in the next day or two days later and like, ah, oh, you know, felt better for a little while, but then it kind of came back later on that night, then most likely the effect I got from manipulation, I think is neurophysiological. So I will recheck it to see if the joint's stuck again. It's not that I won't manipulate them again, but mm -hmm. the cursory screen is if it lasts, Usually I know, okay, I'm pretty sure that was a mechanical effect. Let's clean up motor patterns now because that joint's good. I fixed your second rib. Your pain's gone down considerably. Let's work on the thoracic mobility problem that's probably underlining this and doing it. But I will use that needling, you know, basically right after the manipulation as a, car as a carpet bomb. But sometimes I won't if I think this person's totally going to think it's the needle and not me manip manipulating them. I'll needle in the mm -hmm. second session. But if I know them and I know a lot of my yeah. patients, then I'll go ahead and manipulate them and needle them because you're expecting kind of the package. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I, I think I've said this but on one of these calls before, that I, I think needling is still a good tool to be able to use. But in general, if I have somebody come in on their first visit and I, and I do a needling session with them, that's all they're going to want when they come back. They're just going to be like, just, you know, just jab me with a few needles and I'll be on my way. It's just like, well, you're not going to be mm -hmm. any better. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'll feel good for a couple of days, but then it's going to come back because, it, I mean, let's face it, if we're dealing with somebody that's coming in with a, a lot of these trigger point issues, these trigger points are typically caused by a facilitatory effect, right? So this is that mm -hmm. central sensitization stuff that comes on. And if we don't correct whatever the abnormal feedback mechanism is that's going through the spinal column, through that reflex arc, mm -hmm. the needling is, just, is only going to be a Band-Aid. It's only, and it's, and, and, and at, a, at a certain point, we're going to hit that chemical gradient where now the needling is no longer going to release that electrical component, right? So mm -hmm. we're not going to get that muscle spindle to release the way that we want to. So the effect of the needling is going to diminish pretty rapidly. So I'll, mm -hmm. if I'm going to needle somebody, if I, if I have somebody that, you know, really does well with it, then I try and limit that. So especially somebody that has a motor pattern issue, like a runner um, or swimmer or something like that, or a overhead athlete, then I'll try and keep that needling to four, maybe five sessions, depending on how long I'm going to see this person for. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a few chronic pain patients that I will needle more consistently just because they need those couple of days of relief whenever they can get them. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, when I'm trying to re-educate a, a motor pattern, I want to do it without the needling be just because the needling is, it, it gives them this false sense of security, right? It, it just mm -hmm. gives them this false sense of like, if, if I just get this done twice a week, every week, I'll be able to run forever. And it's just like, well, no, because you're still yeah. getting all of these, these tone issues, right? And so you're going to get, you're going to have all these secondary problems that come along with facilitation as well, where you're going to get these pseudotendinoses and all these other sort of things that kind of come along with it. And it, it, eventually it's going to start to wear out some of the structure of this, those things. So for me, it's just yeah. not something that I want to do a ton of all the time because it's, yeah. it, it, it's been problematic from a mental standpoint from the pa for the patient in these sort of yeah. situations. Yeah. Chronic pain, it's a different story, but. Yeah, it doesn't replace the other neuromuscular retraining and the importance of that aspect of it. You need to fix the patterning that's driving it. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the other things I wanted to talk about when we had a moment, and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be today, but um, like age appropriateness for mobilization and manipulation especially for like i would say women into their 50s 60s 70s um you know the considerations for that and any reason you know i mean we should not assume that everyone in there every woman in their 60s or 70s has like low bone density but how do you you know kind of assess for a you know how aggressive can you be basically? It's probably something that 
you know, again, you don't get it much from in the gym, but, you know, you think about your different barriers and, you know, we're looking for manipulation. We're always looking for, okay, what's the end feel feel like? And for a lot of this women, you start to think of, okay, now what's the end feel? It's what's your, your first tissue resistance, maybe your R1, your R2, in those individuals. So if I come onto the rib and I'm checking the rib or the costar transverse, costar vertebral joints, I want to feel, okay, where's my first resistance? Is this just stiffness in this joint? Where is it? Where is the restriction? You know, I think in that layer, I'm not going so much to, okay, I want to see what the end feel is, but how stiff is this segment? And can I use, I use the osteokinematic and arthrokinematic glides and like the assessments as my treatment. And for those women who are a little more okay. fragile, I may take them through that. I know that, okay, when I, if I rotate the rib cage to the right, you know, my right rim, my right rib should swing backward, kind of like the innominate would go. So it's going to glide posteriorly. I'm going to, I know I'm going to translate left, maybe side bend right, or side bending can be anywhere depending on where that person's probably rotoscoliosis is going to take them. So they're probably off center at that point. But I will follow the ribs and say, okay, can I get this ring in this segment to move? Can I apply the osteokinematics, of that rib between the translations, the flexion extension patterns of the facet joints, and the rib glides? And I'll treat the glides if I think they're very, fairly fragile. I will use my thenar eminence sometimes as a, as a foam roller with proprioception. Mm. I will roll them onto there as if I'm going to manipulate them, and I will just get the feel. I can, I can, you know, I can side bend them and take the rib inward. I can then pull the rib and distract the rib a little bit. I can glide it up or down. I can do the same thing. So I can put proprioceptive input and get a sense of feel like, how does this rib move when I get the, the weight of thorax, thorax on it? So this is in the two bind technique. Yeah. So yeah. With all the ribs are, it's multi-segmental restriction is what they'll have. You have multiple segments which are stiff. So none of it's going to feel good to them per se, unless you go mm -hmm. soft. And that's where the seated technique where you can glide and rotate and flex, extend, and try and glide the guard the or guide the osteokinematic and you know motions is sometimes helpful. Supine techniques can feel you know, may feel slightly aggressive to them, but if I have, I think if there's one segment that's not moving well or that with one segment that's off, think about that natural barrier. I'm not going to go in here and manipulate it, but I'm going to take this joint in all the directions it should go, and can I guide and facilitate it through its normal pathway? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense that it's based on the end feel because we're not going to manip something that feels. Yeah. So you're thinking that R1 or R2? Anyway, but, um, you know, and it's probably slightly to tolerance, right? Like, if it feels really crappy to them. I mean, it's probably not going to feel great, but I think mm -hmm. stiff and productive is a different feeling than, like, oh, I think my bones are going to break. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you should be nowhere near there because you know it's going to happen. You think of... I basically want this one unit to be able to glide. Can I take that either the ring or the one rib and can I take it and will it move within what it's going to give me? Or, okay. What's this rib want to mm -hmm. give me? Let me go with what it's going to allow me to do. And then maybe I work into arm overhead or flexion extension pattern. I may block the bottom facet and say, okay, can they get proprioceptively pull over top of it? Because many times they'll be stuck probably flexion and they'll have 25% more extension than they're, than they're using. And how do I block it and get them to use that extra 25% of the range they're leaving on the table? And that's the margin. That's when they start to feel comfortable because you expand their, uh, your, their ability to use their available range, which they almost do it segmentally through because it's kind of shut off in them. Got it. Do that pretty much exactly the same way. <laughs> do you? Really, Good. Really no help with that. That's a shame because I was really hoping that you have something different. I love it when you come up with something different. So I can go back and play with something. So that's disappointing. No. Yeah. I mean, as far as, you know, patients that are, you know, you, you're concerned about some sort of fragility, you know, that that's mm -hmm. those seated techniques. And we, I use some locking techniques with it, you know, kind of translating above and below in order to kind of create some of those sort of things. And so there's a little more, um, you know, maybe a little more involvement with how to do how I do that sort of stuff from a biomechanical standpoint, but it ends up being the same sort of idea. So the seated techniques that you're talking about would be um, kind of like how we were assessing for like latexion and rotexion. Yes. Where you're, you could extend them and side by them mm -hmm. left and yeah. or right or, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And that's probably going to, I mean, that would be safer and more tolerable than mm -hmm. the supine techniques because you're not putting as much force through it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can always, you can always check, check rib spring or rib, rib cage expansion and um, rib spring to see if they're capable of tolerating something a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that, that's always an option, but the, you know, for me that I always, I've always found that that's because that's supposedly one of the first things that goes is that, that chest wall expansion. And when you start to lose those uh, uh, trabeculae there. And so it's just that kind of like, you know, how much, how much elasticity do they have in the rib cage? Supposedly that's one of the first things that goes with an osteoporosis, osteopenia situation. Um, but I, you know, I, I find that a little bit suspect to, to count on that sort of thing to protect, you know, them and me mm -hmm. um, in a situation where, uh, you know, where I want to try and do something more aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I will check it because it's, <laughs> it's a good safety check to be able to put in your, in my paperwork, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not hanging my hat on that sort of thing all the time. So how would you document that? I, you know, positive rings, ribs, uh, rib spring, something like that. Cause it just feels like a plank of wood, you know, there's no compression yeah. to it. <clears throat> Got it. Yeah, treatment too. I mean, mobilization with movement <clears throat> therapy, or you know, often what I'm going to add to it is they're going to be here. They're going to be, well, they're, they're going to be here. I'm going to work on extension and rotation. You know, it's the same thing. Or you can look at side bending and rotation. Usually, I don't go flexion because they're already here. But one thing they'll do is can I get those segments and extend it as they can? And then can I rotate from extension? Because normally they'll be flexed and they'll flex and rotate. So can I can I find the extension moment and then have them come left or right? And my hands, I'll usually try and get on the ribs, and I'll, I'll try and guide them. So I'll find a lower pole of the rib with my index finger, walk my thumb up the rib. So the, the configuration will be somewhat like this, once you find the rib plane. And then can I take them, kind of guide them into that rotation? Then also have them yep. use their scapula. A lead with the scapula will pull from top down a little bit better, too. So if I want to get work to rotation, you can get on the ribs, guide the rib into the rotation direction I want it. And so you can get that to move a little bit and give them some proprioceptive input so that in my code is even neuromuscular re-ed yeah okay the only the only other thing that i throw in there with that because i'll do that same thing where i have i grab a hold of the ring so basically i'm kind of on the lateral margins here of the ribs is if i see something there well, I'll, I'll actually physically try and correct them and then i'll have them take some breaths in that position mm -hmm. so basically i'm trying to stack the rings this is a diane lee thing um, so if you can try and stack the rings up and down, then that respiratory mechanism will help to kind of reset some of those uh, motor arcs as well. Okay. Um, if you do find, because I treat a lot of really active people in their 50s too. Um, I mean, if you find a pathomechanical end feel, is there any reason not to manipulate them? No. I mean, unless you realize, I think you get, go with your gut on this one. Is this my all? Man, sometimes what I do is, I mean, I'll thrust them. I may put, set them up as cleanly as I can and just lean into it and see if it'll mm -hmm. go. Or flex yeah. and side bend them left and right. And oftentimes you'll get that joint to go. Yeah, I've, I've done it hundreds of times. Yeah. And it, it's all about the setup. I mean, they're, they're paid, I mean, it's kind of the same deal as manipulating somebody that's, you know, just kind of hesitant <clears throat> about being, you know, having their back cracked and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, well, we're just going to set you up and we'll just have you take a breath out and we'll just kind of take up the slack and see what happens. And, the, mm -hmm. you know, those are the ones where you kind of really focus in and you're just like, all right, here, here comes my barrier and mm -hmm. here's the breath out. And mm -hmm. pop. it's just like, yeah, yeah. that wasn't so bad, was it? You know, yeah. You don't have to jump on them then. You don't have to produce the thrust yourself. It's just the body. Yeah. Does it on its own. Yeah, I feel like I'm just like in a manipulation shy period right now that I'm trying to get myself out of. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically like I don't want to be nervous to manipulate everybody. I think whipping that lady's ankle and messing up her back really <laughs> set me like yeah. back mentally and I'm like, okay, don't be a wuss, Tara. Like, no, I just, just add, add, add a 25% like, J stroke and it, it redirects the force. Yeah. Um, I taught that this weekend, by the way. I, I, I spoke about you. Oh, cool. I included you in the course. Oh, yeah, just recently I was talking to somebody. <laughs> well, I'm glad gotta, to give you some uh, ammunition. I got to roll, guys, so. Okay. Dave, right, I'll Eric. talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Eric.
Yep, we'll see you, Carol. Bye. Um, do you have to go? I got till I got till two fifteen. Couple more minutes. Okay. Um, so to follow up on that, we learned the like pre manipulation test for thoracic spine is the, like the shear along track sign and then the thoracic slump. Mm -hmm. So like what happens if, um, cause I have a girl, she's like my age, she has two young kids, she co-sleeps with them and she's always a mess. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure um, it's very, I'm sure it's like cervical thoracic, you know, she has like, mm -hmm elbow and wrist pain and problems um and I think she needs a lot of work there mm -hmm. but when I like did all that she seemed stable in her thoracic spine and then her she's got like her left quad reflex is like three plus or something mm -hmm. you know a little yeah. extra or like asymmetrical um so when you you know, if you have really clean everything negative, then yeah, go ahead and manipulate them. But if you have something that's like a little muddy, then how do you tease out like that's incidental or not? Um, so she has a slightly brisk reflex or a brisk reflex. I mean, brisk. If you're thinking I mean it's not like, because hmm? yeah, I mean, it'd have to be if something to make a, a reflex kind of higher. You're thinking, okay, is this upper motor neuron? Or is this just slightly facilitated where she has a brisker reflex? Yeah. I mean, or she also she has lumbar dysfunction and a lot of mm -hmm. like hip and like hip, hip and knee problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, is this basically I'm trying to figure out if she's safe to manipulate. And then that would be like for a thoracic spine and this can flow into next week, but then would a distraction technique be safer for her than a supine technique? And then B, would a rib distraction technique, because that technically is a different angle of thrust and it's not shearing the thoracic spine, would that also be safe? The, the easiest one to do in the middle of things is just the seat attraction. It's just a lift and think of, it's not so much that you need to think about, okay, I need a big thrust here. It's just a matter of, can I lift this segment? And think about lifting, if she's smaller, the bottom segment. Get the towel above there and think, okay, I just want to distract the bottom segment from the top. And you could almost just use a little bit of a jerky oscillation. Most of the time mm -hmm. it'll go. If yeah, really she's really small. If it's really restricted, you'll feel it's like, oh, this thing is just, once I get it up here, you can tell it, oh, this is an abnormal feel to it. The spine doesn't elongate. Mm -hmm. It should elongate through as you pick them up. You feel it stretch, especially yeah. in, their, in their 30s. When it does, when all of a sudden she comes up like a unit, you know, okay, either this, my fascially, she'd have to be pretty charged up, but more likely you probably have a stuck segment right there that you feel that the, yeah. the, the, the force doesn't pull through that segment. She's somebody who I would do it pretty, pretty, pretty cleanly on or pretty quickly on if you're feeling almonds. I, I'm not sure that thoracic segment will probably give you more bang for the buck. But like, yeah, when I cautiously, you know, step into the water, then what I would do is I would take your hand and I would go through and I, I would do, I would set up for the rib, rib manipulation, the distraction rib manipulation, roll her over, start on the lower ribs. And what you should feel is as you roll her onto that rib, the rib should move. The rib should, rib should have any problem gliding. And then when that rib moves well, and then you can push across the body for the, basically the ventral glide, or the, and then you have the lateral glide you can do, pulling out mm -hmm. move to the next rib. Go up and down the ribs. At the very least, it's proprioceptive input, and the 32-year-olds don't think that feels really good. Because mm -hmm. you're stretching the ribs, the capsules, everything around it. Gets a chance well, she said it felt like shit. Is the, <laughs> I mean, it's oh, really? like stiff. Like, she's, she is very stiff, so we get her set up, because I, I did mm -hmm. that. I set her up to... Mm -hmm. to do the rib stuff, not the thoracic, not a thoracic distraction, um, mm -hmm. supine or thoracic anything, but I just set her up thinking, even if I'm not sure that her nervous system signs are good, I can at least like check how these feel in mm -hmm. that position. And she was like, well, that feels like stiff and like crap, but like what needs to be done. Yeah. So... That's probably a good sign. It's probably, you know, you're on the right track. When you load somebody up there stiff, they're like, oh, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And then, okay, maybe I want to get in and out of this fast. Or I'll roll them on my thumb, you know, and just, it could be just pressing it. It could just be just a quick mm -hmm. press and back out of it and see how she responds. Yeah. 
she was pretty sore after and a couple of th- when she came back a couple of days later because now she's starting to get like jaw pain i'm like literally i'm treating this girl like head to foot and she has tarsal coalition mm-hmm. so literally head to toe um mm-hmm. you know and it's hard because she's so sporadically in here she works from home every other week mm-hmm. because of the building is closed or her work organizes mm-hmm. like that and she doesn't really have any time or prioritize taking care of herself <laughs> Yeah. So I feel like the only thing she does is come here and then mm-hmm. how much can I actually accomplish in like 30 minutes or yeah. whatever. I mean, yeah, I know I can accomplish a lot in 30 minutes compared to other PTs, but like, where am I? Am I feel like, I feel like I've just been chasing it a little bit with her because. Because you're treating her with one arm behind she's... your back. Yeah. Is that you, a joke? You need to panic get in there gently. And, and, and that's the thing is think about it. Not so much as I need to go in there a minute, 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 apply mm-hmm. the joint mechanics to it, go in there with a little bit of pressure and then you can decide, okay, yeah, I need to go a little harder with this. So let me do, let me pick seat attraction. Let me do the rib glide. Seat mm-hmm. attraction is a good, you know, intersegmental technique it's general, yeah. but it many times it gets it done, especially in a 30 something year old. Yeah. So would you block the top or bottom? I mean, you could do either, right? You could block the bottom you, segment you and traction bias. up or, block the top segment and let mm-hmm. gravity drop it down, right? Yeah. What I often feel is that it's like the gravity drop technique on there. I get a sense of how much does the spine elongate? Like maybe is there information in. there where you put it in a certain spot? Like, oh, you know, I pick her up and her spine just comes up off the table or does it slinky a little bit? So like the triathlete that I showed, you know, with her spine, I do that to her. I pick her up. It's like, it's like she's glued together. You know, she or her, yeah. I don't think her spine slinky or separate at all. She just comes up as a unit. Whereas mm-hmm. somebody like her, may, maybe you may start to pull up and her pelvis stays on the ground for a little bit as her spine elongates. And then once everything gets mm-hmm. taut, then she comes up. And that gives you an idea of just, okay, the level of stiffness. Okay. So interestingly, um, somebody spine comes up at once, multi-segmental stiffness, probably not going to go that hard because probably multiple segments that are stiff, this isn't a classic sublux joint, or there may be one hidden in there. So it's a little it. hard to tell. Your girl will be like, oh, this feels loose, loose, loose. Oh. This spot isn't moving like the others. 